バイリンガルウェブマガジン DIG 東京のディレクターを務めるカズーこと G ・カズオペニアです。英語力がどんどんつく学習法へようこそ。DIG 東京は8つのカテゴリーのコラムを日本語と英語で併記しているウェブマガジンです。英語力がどんどんつく学習法は僕がこれまでの翻訳や通訳の仕事を通して培ったさまざまな英語上達についてのノウハウをレッスン形式にまとめたもので、読む、書く、聞く、話すという4つのスキルが身につくと思います。ディグ東京のビジネスやライフスタイルに関するコラムのテキストを用いるのでビジネスですぐに使える英語力や旅行や海外での生活に役立つ英会話力がつきますディグ東京のテキストと YouTube の動画を使ったこのレッスンを繰り返すことで大学受験のための英語力はもちろんのこと TOEIC、TOEFL、英検などの試験のための英語力もどんどんつくことでしょうではこのレッスンの方法について説明しますまずは DIG 東京のテキストのページと YouTube の動画をタブや別ウィンドウを使って両方ともすぐ見られる状態にしてくださいそうしたら DIG 東京の日本語のテキストだけをまず先に読んでください次に英語のテキストだけを読んでください英語のテキストでわからない英単語や熟語をネット検索を使って自分で調べてみましょうもちろんわからない日本語があればそれもチェックしてください次に英語のテキストをもう一度読んでみてください。これで予習が終了です。ここからこの動画によるレッスンを行います。この YouTube の動画を再生させて英語を聞きながら DIG 東京の英語テキストを目読してください。次に英語テキストを見ないでこの YouTube の動画だけを見ながら英語をよく聞いてください。最後に YouTube の音声に合わせて英語テキストを音読してください。以上のステップを繰り返すことで、英語の表現力、読解力、ヒアリング力、スピーキング力が確実に上達するはずです。2回目以降のレッスンの際には、この画面の下にあるもっと見るを開いて、テキストの朗読のところをクリックしてください。すぐにテキスト本文を読み上げる部分に行けます。今回は、Language and Ensemble 004 SNS 英語術 on NHK e t e l e My wardrobe for our April 19th hashtag Fridays for Future episode の英語のテキストを朗読します。世界へ発信 SNS 英語術の2019年度3回目に取り上げたテーマです。楽しみながらレッスンしましょう。One, our theme this week, hashtag Fridays for Future. The hashtag topic for the third episode of our 2019 season was hashtag Fridays for Future. Fridays for Future is a large scale movement of school students who are demanding action to address global warming, inspired by the Swedish teen activist Greta Thunberg. Since August 2018, Thunberg has skipped school every Friday to conduct sit ins and protests in front of the Swedish parliament and beyond. Her posts on Twitter and Instagram quickly drew attention from around the world, and the school strike expanded to Germany, Belgium, and the UK. And other parts of Europe, as well as to the US and Australia. Ever since, students, mostly high school students, have carried on the strike every Friday. It's worth noting that the movement is centered on Western countries influenced by Christianity. In the US, the push to demand action to address global warming has been growing, galvanized by the Trump administration's announcement in June 2017 that the US would be withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Then in 2018, California was beset by the deadliest wildfire in its history. And on the opposite end of the country, the Florida panhandle was pummeled by Hurricane Michael. Statistics show that more and more Americans are worried about global warming. This week in Language and Ensembles, I'll be going over some of the figures that have shaped the environmental movement in the US and how the movement itself and the terminology used to define it have changed along with the times. 2. The Romanticists and Naturalists of the 19th Century and First Half of the 20th Century. Environmentalism in the U.S. has its roots in American thinkers of the 19th century. Greatly influenced by the European Romanticists of the 18th and 19th centuries, they emphasized sensitivity to the natural world and subjectivity. Their focus was not on the environment. Rather, it was on beauty and the divine as seen in nature and the wilderness. Footnote 1 Romanticism was an aesthetic and intellectual movement that originated in Europe and had its heyday between the late 18th century 
and the first half of the 19th century. As a reaction to the rationalism of the time, it emphasized individualism, human emotions, and subjectivity. The rationalism of the time had been a reaction to Christianity in the Middle Ages. One of those thinkers was Ralph Waldo Emerson. In his 1836 essay, Nature, Emerson put forth the idea that nature was emblematic of the divine, and living in society was making us take nature for granted. He argues that we can only truly know the beauty of nature by getting away from society and experiencing, not observing, but engaging with all of our senses and becoming one with nature in solitude. To him, to know that beauty was a spiritual experience of the divine. Footnote 2. Ralph Waldo Emerson was an American philosopher, essayist, and poet. He was an advocate of individualism and is remembered as a leader of the transcendentalist movement. Footnote 3. Transcendentalism is an American intellectual movement of the 19th century that was greatly influenced by European Romanticism. Its tenets include individualism, idealism, the mysticism of nature, and the idea that humans can understand truth through intuition. Thinker Henry David Thoreau, who read Nature while he was attending Harvard College and became closely acquainted with Emerson, took Emerson's philosophy and expanded on it. Encouraged by him and his teachings on solitude and self-reliance, he spent more than two years staying in a small cabin in the woods by Walden Pond in Massachusetts, living almost entirely off the land. He wrote about his experiences and the beauty of nature in his seminal book Walden, which would greatly influence the environmental movement to come. In his writings, he also put forth the idea that untamed nature, removed from civilization and society, was emblematic of freedom, and that humans could gain autonomy and learn to be free thinkers by experiencing the wildness of nature. In this way, Thoreau justified civil disobedience and greatly inspired 20th century political and social activists such as Mahatma Gandhi. Footnote 4. Henry David Thoreau was an American writer, thinker, poet, naturalist, and historian. Footnote 5. Civil disobedience is the active, professed refusal of a citizen to obey certain laws, demands, orders, or commands of a government or occupying international power. From Wikipedia. Footnote 6. Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer, religious, and political leader who advocated nonviolent resistance as a way to induce social change. He is remembered as the leader of the Indian independence movement against British rule. Thoreau's writings deeply moved the Scottish-American naturalist John Muir, another key figure of environmentalism in the U.S. Muir recognized the human conceit inherent to the individualism and self-reliance extolled by transcendentalism, and advocated a more ecocentric and biocentric view, a symbiotic relationship between humans and nature. The settlement of the American frontier and the gold rush brought an influx of people to the West Coast, and as plans moved forward for the reclamation of the vast wilderness, Muir argued passionately for its preservation. He devoted his life to protecting America's natural lands, especially the Sierra Nevadas, a mountain range that runs along California's eastern border. For that reason, he is remembered as the father of American's national park system. Footnote 7. John Muir was an influential American naturalist, author, and botanist. Footnote 8. A naturalist is a student and observer of nature, fauna and flora, and natural history. By contrast, Gifford Pinchot, a Republican politician, and the first chief of the United States Forest Service, held the view that our natural environment was a resource, and that wise use of that resource would constitute the highest use of nature. To take an extreme view, for preservationists like Muir, there was inherent value in nature itself. For conservationists like Pinchot, the value was in how renewable natural resources could be used in a sustainable manner for human benefit. As the frontier was settled and developed in the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century, this point would prove to be a divisive one for environmentalism. Footnote 9. Gifford Pinchot was a Republican politician and forester. He called conservation the art of producing from the forest whatever it can yield for the service of man. 
The photographer Ansel Adams is another important figure of the environmental movement in the U.S. Born in San Francisco, at 17 he joined the Sierra Club, an environmental organization founded by Muir, and explored the Sierra Nevadas as a mountaineer as he honed his photography skills. His aesthetic is characterized by sharp focus, rich tonal detail, and the meticulous effort he put into development. The resulting photographs capture the majesty of the natural lands that Muir fought so hard to preserve, and played an integral role in drawing attention to environmental issues. Footnote 10. Ansel Adams was an American photographer and naturalist. He is remembered for his black and white landscape photography of Yosemite and the Sierra Nevadas. Ansel Adams, 400 Photographs. This is a collection of 400 of Adams' best work, spanning the entire length of his career. 3. The Hippies and Tree Huggers of the Second Half of the 20th Century By the 1960s, the word environmentalism had come into widespread use. Environmentalism is an umbrella term that encompasses both preservationism and conservationism. As industrialization and deforestation progressed, environmentalists, who had up to that point focused on protecting the country's natural lands, began appealing for political policies to address environmental pollution. This new form of environmentalism developed alongside, and indeed overlaps in many ways with, the hippie movement of the 60s. The hippie movement was a counterculture movement, partly centered in San Francisco, that drew inspiration from Thoreau's message of free thought. Hippies grew their hair long and wore jeans and sandals, or went barefoot, as a way to question social norms. Men grew out their beards, and women went braless and without makeup. They got their clothes at second-hand shops and practiced a lifestyle that was in direct opposition to corporate culture and consumerism. They sang the praises of the back-to-the-land movement, organic farming, and alternative sources of energy. In adopting the iconic peace symbol, advocated for pacifism, an end to war, and civil rights. They conducted sit-ins and protests, cultivating a culture of activism that continues to serve as the foundation for movements like Hashtag Fridays for Future. However, the lifestyles and actions of hippies and environmentalists would rub some the wrong way. Those anti-hippies and anti-environmentalists would come to adopt the epithet tree hugger. The term tree hugger has its roots in India, where activist women resorted to hugging trees in order to protest and prevent them from being cut down. But as anti-hippie sentiment grew, the word became a derogatory term for environmentalists. For example, the word came to connote misanthropy. If a tree hugger was someone who loved nature, then that must mean they hate humans, as if love for nature and love for humankind were mutually exclusive. Tree huggers were also painted as socially awkward, similar to how otaku are portrayed today. Furthermore, in America's male-dominated society, the act of hugging has long been associated with mothers and children, an effeminate and sentimental act. In other words, to call a woman a tree hugger would be misogynistic, and to call a man a tree hugger was to insinuate that they were not a man, or to put it more plainly, that they were homosexual. In this way, those opposed to the hippie movement and environmentalism painted those who advocated for environmental issues as weak and unworthy of being taken seriously. Those negative associations remain to some degree to this day, although recently more and more environmentalists are taking back and embracing the term tree hugger, re-imbuing it with its original resolve. 4. The Conceit of Those Who Believe They Can Save the World in the decades that followed the 60s, various issues stemming from environmental pollution started coming to light. In the 1970s, the United States Environmental Protection Agency was established, and the depletion of the ozone layer, which acts as a shield that absorbs most of the harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun, became a global issue. The main cause was determined to be manufactured chemicals, specifically chlorofluorocarbons, which were in wide use in refrigerants and aerosol spray products. An ozone loss was seen as a major threat, resulting in increased rates of skin cancer. In the 80s, acid rain and groundwater pollution became the environmental issues of the day. The debate regarding nuclear power also reached a peak, with the Three Mile Island accident in 1979 and the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. 
By the end of the 80s, the fight to save the rainforest was underway. In the 90s, global warming became an issue that transcended national borders. These days, the term global warming is seen as interchangeable with climate change, but growing up, I distinctly remember the former being the predominant term being talked about, as well as the one we learned in science class. Kids, myself included, feared that the Earth was on its way to becoming one massive sauna. Then in the 2000s, climate change came into widespread use, about a 50-50 split with global warming. In recent years, however, climate change seems to have become the preferred term. I imagine that has something to do with the fact that global warming sounds like a steady, linear rise in temperature, which can be debunked by the odd cold spell, while climate change more accurately characterizes the planet beset by the myriad effects of environmental pollution. It was against the backdrop of the global warming debate that former U.S. Vice President Al Gore captivated a nation and the world with the 2006 documentary An Inconvenient Truth. While many have criticized the way the film exaggerates its presentation of data as fear-mongering, it is inarguable that the film raised awareness around the world regarding environmental issues. Footnote 11. Al Gore is an American politician. He served two terms as vice president under President Bill Clinton. In 2000, he ran for president, but lost to George W. Bush after a heavily disputed Florida recount. Footnote 12. An Inconvenient Truth. Director Davis Guggenheim. This documentary is anchored by a slideshow presentation by Al Gore about the effect of global warming on the planet. The film won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, and Gore would later be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to disseminate information about climate change. As a result of all of these environmental movements and efforts, people are increasingly conscious about leading an eco-friendly lifestyle that minimizes personal carbon footprint. These types of lifestyles are sometimes called Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, or LOHAS. And our environmental vocabulary has expanded accordingly. For example, people who prefer to eat foods that are grown and produced locally are known as locavores. People who seek out partners who share their eco-friendly lifestyles are known as ecosexuals. An awareness of environmental issues has become integrated into the very fabric of our social lives. Footnote 13. Carbon footprint refers to the total amount of carbon dioxide emissions produced by an individual, organization, or company as a result of its regular activities. Footnote 14. LOHAS is an acronym for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability and is a commonly used term in Japan, brought into common parlance by advertising agency giant Dentsu. From a different standpoint, however, it can be argued that it's not so much that adherents revere nature or the environment, Rather, they are using nature and the environment as causes through which to define their own identity. The conceit that nature is under the domination of human beings can also be seen in slogans of the environmental movement like, Save the Planet. In this way, words can be used to express who we are, or used as weapons to diminish others. And it is important to remember that they are also tools that we use to put our environment and our planet under our dominion. 5. What living in Japan has taught me. Back when I was a teenager living in the States, I lived under the assumption that nature and humankind were at odds with one another, and environmental issues existed as a way to overcome that adversarial relationship. I didn't realize that the notion of taking care of nature and the environment inherently draws a distinction between our environment and us. Ever since I graduated from college and moved to Japan, however, I've increasingly come to realize that humans are inherently a part of nature and their environment. In the monotheistic Christian-dominated cultures of the West, humankind and nature are concepts that are in opposition to one another. However, in cultures defined by Shinto, Hinduism, and Buddhism, all polytheistic religions, the unification of humans and nature is seen as good. Footnote 15. Monotheism is the doctrine or belief that there is but one God. Merriam-Webster. Footnote 16. Christianity is the religion derived from Jesus Christ, based on the Bible as sacred scripture, and professed by Eastern, Roman Catholic, and Protestant bodies. Merriam-Webster. Footnote 17. Shinto is the indigenous religion of Japan, 
consisting chiefly in the cultic devotion to deities of natural forces and veneration of the emperor as a descendant of the sun goddess, Merriam-Webster. Hinduism is the dominant religion of India that emphasizes dharma with its resulting ritual and social observances and often mystical contemplation and aesthetic practices. Merriam-Webster Footnote 19 Buddhism is a religion of Eastern and Central Asia growing out of the teaching of Siddhartha Gautama that suffering is inherent in life and that one can be liberated from it by cultivating wisdom, virtue, and concentration. Merriam-Webster Footnote 20 Polytheism is belief in or worship of more than one god. Merriam-Webster Over the ten plus years I've lived in Japan, I've experienced numerous natural disasters, such as the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, but I've also experienced the many blessings of nature, namely subtle seasonal changes throughout the year and how that fosters the delicate seasonality of food ingredients. In the U.S., the notion of helping those who are less fortunate and engaging in volunteer work often stems from Christian beliefs. When you look at something like the outpouring of support in Japan for those affected by natural disasters, the bonds appear to sprout spontaneously, naturally. This notion is perhaps best embodied in Emperor Akihito of Japan, who has aged with grace and will be abdicating at the end of April. He stands in contrast to the kind of wealthy Americans who attempt to retain the appearance of youth for as long as inhumanly possible. 6. My Wardrobe This Week Yellow Chinos by Brooks Brothers Like the pink chinos I wore last week, these yellow chinos are from Brooks Brothers Casual Line Red Fleece, 10,000 yen plus tax. For the longest time, my wardrobe was all dark blues and blacks, with pastel colors nowhere to be found. This spring and summer, my mission is to wear these two chinos until I'm pulling them off with a plum. Beige Socks by Tabio. These are beige silk and cotton business socks, 1800 yen plus tax, from sock store Tabio's location in Omotesando Hills. The sole is cotton and the rest is high quality silk. Red Jacket by Zerbino. Red Button Down Shirt by Shibuya Sebu. Square Wooden Cufflinks by MFYS. Chukka Boots by Red Wing. Brown glasses by Zoff. 7. Notes from my stylist Scarlett on this ensemble. As Kazoo has mentioned numerous times in the past, the show is shot against a blue screen, meaning that his wardrobe cannot contain any blue. Another wardrobe consideration for television is that certain stripes and checkered patterns result in a moire effect, meaning it's usually best to avoid them altogether. What's more, the computer-generated background for the show makes ample use of primary colors, making it difficult to put together an ensemble that complements or contrasts with the palette. These were the considerations behind all of the ensembles I put together for Kazoo for the 2018 season. Although challenging, I feel like I have finally gotten a grasp of the kinds of looks that work well for the show. This week, I built an ensemble around a pair of yellow chinos from Brooks Brothers that Kazoo got along with the pink ones he wore last week. Normally, I would try to use a lighter color on top, but because of the computer-generated background, I went with a red button-down shirt and deep red jacket to provide more of a contrast. The look would certainly be a little much, a little too loud to wear about town, but it is just right for the set of the show. For this week, both the MC Haruhi-san and co-pilot Gori-san wore low-key beige-colored outfits, and Kazoo's colorful ensemble proved to be just right in terms of bringing balance to the show. In the interstitial skit, Gori-san's shoes and Kazoo's shoes seem to be trying to outshine each other, the best kind of entertainment for a stylist like me. Ijo, Language and Ensemble 004, SNS Egojutsu on NHK e-tele. My wardrobe for our April 19th hashtag Fridays for Future episode. No ego texto o rodoku shimashita. Ikaga deshita ka? Amerika, tokuni California ni okeru kankyou hogo undou nisuite kakimashita. California ni asobi ni iku kikai ga arimashita ra, yosemite kokuritsu kouen ni zehi itte mite kudasai. Kono kontentsu ga kini itta ra, YouTube no kono douga no migi shita ni aru botan kara, channel toroku o zehi okonatte kudasai. テキストの最後にある Facebook、Twitter、Instagram のアイコンから DigTokyo の公式アカウントに入りフォローしてください
ご意見ご要望がありましたら YouTube や SNS のコメント欄にご記入ください。www.digtokyo.jp